Good morning, friends. Hello, Kirk. Good morning. As we gather this morning for worship, uh, Lindell will get us started with some prelude music. Here's Lindell. Friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning, Kirk. Good morning. Good morning. What a joy it is for us to gather this Lord's Day here at the Kirk of Kansas City. A delight to be with you today. We are uh, overjoyed to gather together online and on site this fourth Sunday in the season of Easter. If you're worshiping with us here on site, please take a moment to find our ritual of friendship pads. They're usually on one edge of your pew. Help us uh, fill them out, uh, tear off a sheet, leave it in the offering plate as you exit the sanctuary. It's a good way for us to receive prayer requests, joys or concerns you have. Also, if you're sitting next to someone, you can catch their name. That's a helpful task uh, as well, too. For those who are joining us online, a word of welcome to you as well. Uh, if you're new around here, I'm Chad Herring. I'm the pastor of the Kirk. We are a Christian community seeking to follow God on the way of Jesus Christ and part of the Presbyterian Church USA. We aspire to be guided by an inclusive theology, a welcoming spirit, and a commitment to seeking after peace and justice in the world. You can learn more about our church at our website. Uh, look for kckirk.org or find us on social media. Look for the Kirk of KC. Our contact information is there on the screen. We'd love to hear from you. And if you want to get a hold of me, my contact information is there as well. Our motto around here is community-minded, loving, and serving. Help us build community online by using those chat rooms uh, on Zoom or on Facebook. Let us know where you are, what's going on in your neck of the woods. We would appreciate hearing from you. The chat room is also particularly helpful if you're watching us live. So you can send in prayer requests, and we will gather them together uh, and uh, add them to our community prayers just a little bit later in the service today. Say hi to Mitch, who's on there. Uh, she'll help answer questions about our community. Two quick announcements from our service team this morning as we invite all of you to join us in the work of this community of faith. 
We have several projects ongoing designed to help alleviate poverty and hunger and to serve our neighbor. One of them is our regular partnership with Harvesters, the Community Food Bank. Our next trip to Harvesters is this week, Thursday. Uh, sign up today uh, on the table near the front office, or you can contact the church office, contact me. We'll get you signed up. We'd love to have you join us. Also, secondly, we are extending just one more invitation. Uh, mouthful. We are extending one more invitation uh, to offer a financial gift or a gift of time and involvement uh, with our friends at Cherith Brook. That's the Presbyterian Catholic Worker House downtown that serves the homeless in Kansas City. Um, so far, the Kirk has collected in terms of loof offering from all of you about $500, a little over $500, uh, and that will be paired with the $1,000 that our service team will be offering all to go towards uh, the building renovation project. You can help out today by contacting the people who are on the screen. It's not on the screen. You can contact us today by, by helping the people. Uh, there. Contact the church office, and we will get you connected. If you're on site, you can talk to Jerry. Jerry, wave for us. He's right over there. He'll help get you connected as well. Thank you for your generous support of this important Kirk partner. Now that we're done with our announcements, we can get started. Friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's worship uh, God together. I invite all who wish to stand with me. Please rise as we call ourselves to worship by praying responsibly uh, our gathering words. Let's all pray together. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessing and honor are yours, O God. Glory to God forever and ever. Alleluia. Together, let us worship God. Amen. Amen. Please join me in uh, singing our opening hymn. That's number 65 in your hymnals, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Friends, our liturgy today is Claudia Gravit. Claudia will greet us, and then will lead us all in our prayer of affirmation this morning. Good morning. Good morning. During the season of Easter, we offer a prayer of affirmation to celebrate the reality of the resurrection in our lives and in the world. We affirm the goodness, the grace, and the love of God the one who grants us wholeness and forgiveness, the one who sets us free to love the world. Join me as we say together our prayer of affirmation. Please pray with me. O living God, who raised Jesus from the dead, we love you, Father, this morning. We lift our hearts in praise. We sing hymns of joy. Amen. 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 Even our hearts are heavy and our eyes you are forever. You comfort all who mourn. You wipe away all tears. You bring joy in the morning. 
Teach us, O oh God, to trust in your gracious love, to rest in your unfailing goodness, to hope in your true promise, that we may rejoice all our days and share the good news. Death is defeated. All are made alive in you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture, our first scripture reading this morning is a, is a very familiar passage. From Psalms 23. And I just like that this is a personal favorite passage of mine. My mother often throughout my childhood and even into my adulthood would often read and re read and I think at this point she must have it memorized. She often would read it to me as a child, like I said, as an adult, whenever I felt scared or nervous, and also at times when I just needed to be reminded of the great strength that God has given each and every one of us. So I just wanted to say thanks, Mom, on this Mother's Day. The first scripture reading, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths of his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I heard an amen out there. That's right. Amen. Friends, I, I don't mean to be prideful. I know that's uh, not a, always a great thing to do and to be, and I honestly had nothing to do with it. But doesn't our choir sound great this morning? I mean, well done. Um, grateful for every good and wonderful gift, friends. Thank you so much. Um, friends, this period of time between Easter and Pentecost, it's a gift, really. All of the stories we're looking at invite us to take the impacts in of Easter morning, what the resurrection means for us, for others, for the world. I mean, consider the stories that we've looked at these last few weeks. Jesus appears to Mary. That was Easter Sunday. Jesus appears to the apostles up in the locked room, except for Thomas. He wasn't there. But Jesus comes back anyway to show his hands and his side. That was the week after Easter. And then last week, we explored John's account of Jesus on the lake shore, cooking fish and sharing bread for breakfast for the disciples who had gone fishing, seeking to return to life the way that it was. But as we talked about, Easter is not about life returning to normal. There, there are things in life that change you, right? Moving away to college, uh, a decision to stand up for something big, something that matters, the, the birth of your child, often if you're a parent, um, buying a house for a spell, uh, or by a house settling down for a spell, all very profound and impactful. And, and as profound and as impactful as these things are in our lives, Scripture suggests to us that Easter is an even more life-altering reality than all of these. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to turn to the Acts of the Apostles for, for some additional stories that will help us explore ways in which this might be true. It's all about the impact of Easter for us and for the world. And today's reading uh, is one of these kinds of stories. This is the story of Saul's conversion. Uh, this is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. And so I invite you to listen with me uh, for God's word to us today. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand. And brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight. And be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. 
and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. May God bless to us our reading and our understanding and our applying of this word to how we live our lives. Amen. So I had seen this meme before, but I saw it again this last week. It was a picture of author Anne Lamont, and it said, captioned underneath it, a famous quote of hers, which goes like this. You can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. <laughs> right? Saul, the pre-Damascus Road version of the man who would later receive the name that we know him by, the Apostle Paul. Saul represented that truth perfectly. We meet, uh, we meet Saul earlier in Acts. He's already a famous and feared persecutor of the followers of Jesus, described as vicious in attacking these first believers. Up to this point, he'd say that his life was rather successful, that, that all was going according to plan. When, on his way to Damascus, uh, to literally, right, persecute followers of the way, as he says, Saul is met by the living Christ. And just like that, this persecutor becomes the follower. A life of hate and vitriol becomes a life lived for Jesus Christ. It's a 180 degree change, right? What happened? I mean, this is a story of wrenching movement from the old to something new, from being church enemy number one to the greatest leader of the church in its mission in the world. There is literally no church, no mission to the Gentiles without Paul. This is a story about what happens when God intervenes and captivates you. I mean, everything can change. How much do we think that that's realistic, right? Maybe it depends on what we affirm about whether there's space for something other than ourselves moving in our lives. Years ago, the Swedish church scholar Kirster Stendhal, which all of you know, right? Kirster Stendhal, um, wrote an influential article on Acts 9 called Paul and the Introspective Conscience of the West. It was a critique, really, about how we in the modern world have put our lives together. Stendhal uh, started by lifting up the perspective of Martin Luther, the, the reformer Martin Luther, who, when writing about Paul's conversion, describes Paul as someone searching for something, a person who finally finds what he's looking for there on the Damascus Road. But here's the thing. Nothing in this story says that Paul was searching for anything maybe except for followers of Jesus to persecute, right? This is not the story of a man who is miserable and tormented until he finds a gracious God. That's Luther's account. But rather someone who is living life on his own terms, quite happily, thank you very much, until, quite without warning, he is found by the risen Christ. And to read the story otherwise is to read it, Stendhal asserts, from the point of view of the egocentric, that is the eye-centered, subjective conscience of the Western mind. That's a mouthful, for sure. That's just a fancy way of saying, well, we always think it's about us, right? Not to read it as it's actually described there in the Holy Scripture. Saul isn't searching for Jesus, no, on that road to Damascus. God intervenes. When we think about ourselves, we, we tend to think about our lives mainly are the result of what we've managed to make of our lives, right? Our self is whatever we've chosen, worked, decided, and strived to be. This very Western notion, your own bootstraps, right? And all that. But when you read carefully, you'll see that the Bible has a very different take on who we are, right? Who we are, says Scripture, is not merely what we put together for ourselves, but what God puts together in us. I mean, Scripture knows little of our earnest, agonized search for God. It doesn't deny that impulse exists. It's more that God's search for us takes center stage, like Mary learned at that open tomb, like Thomas found in that locked safe house, like the disciples encountered on the seashore. 
and just like Paul discovers on the Damascus Road. <laughs> the Guardian newspaper once declared that 1993 movie Groundhog Day to be the perfect comedy. Oh, just take a second to take that in. Nine years ago at its 20th anniversary, next year will be its 30th anniversary, friends. Nine years ago at its 20th anniversary, another film critic called the movie the single comedy most likely to be remembered 50 years from now. I don't know, really? Groundhog's Day, right? Seems a bit of a stretch. Do you even remember anything about that movie? I don't know. But I do think that it's a good movie to describe something about our modern age. I mean, it was a breakout role for Bill Murray, right, who plays as he is very good to do, the most superficial of men, someone who works the most inane of jobs in this instance. I mean, he's a reporter, specifically a weather reporter. I'm sorry, I love reporters. I know that there are some among our friends. In this instance, he has the most crazy job. And it's just like other weather reporters sometimes go out to the seashore, right, to report on a hurricane, or go out to the Kansas prairie during tornado season. Murray finds himself in a hotel room in Puxatawney, Pennsylvania, on a drab February 2nd morning, destined to cover the Groundhog Day ceremony. It's such a strange American tradition. Don't you think trying to predict the end of winter by whether it's a sunny day on an early February Puck's Tawny morning? But there he is, waking up to the radio, blaring Sonny and Cher's whining rendition of their most pointless song, I Got You, Babe. And Murray plods through his day, right, encountering a group of wearisome people along the way. They annoy him, mainly because they're annoying. Fine. There's the groundhog and the event, and it's all over, and he goes to bed ready to get on with his life. And the next morning, the radio awakens him at the same time with the same song. It's Sonny and Cher all over again. And get this, it's the same weather report on the radio, which Murray finds just a little bit odd. But things become even stranger as he stumbles through what exactly the same day as yesterday and then to bed and then to rise and his days repeat themselves day in and day out. He's trapped over and over on that same Groundhog's Day. And after the 20th repetition of the same meaningless day, Murray realizes that he's in hell. I mean, right? First, he tries a number of vain attempts to end it all. He leaps from a building. He falls in front of a speeding truck, blowing himself and the kidnapped head, a groundhog up in this fiery explosion. But after attempt, after attempt, after attempt, still he wakes up in the, ne- the next morning. Same bed, same day, same Sonny and Cher serenade. And it's exhausting. He's desperate to find some sense of meaning amid what's becoming to be boredom. So he he engages in a life of crime, right? Doing all those things that he was always reluctant to do, right? Uh, Before his days become this gruesome repetition. Only to find that even after the worst of crimes, he awakens the next morning to I got you, babe. And he begins the day all over again without any consequence. realizing that he has no way of escaping the hundrum of this uh, same day, hellishly repeated, he finally launches into this program of self-improvement. He takes up the piano. He memorizes French poetry. He begins to help people since having lived this same day dozens of times, he he knows exactly when and where there'll be a car with a woman with a flat tire or a man choking on his meal or a kid falling from a tree. And he actually transforms himself into an interesting person. And and in the process, the people around him, those for whom he had such contempt, become meaningful for him. Finally, after more than 12,000 days, that's more than 34 years, Murray frees himself from this hellish repetition through this heroic self-improvement when he falls in love with the lovely Rita, the other main character. They wake up together the next day, February 3rd, ready to start their lives anew. So an early version of the multiverse, those of you who've just seen the most recent Doctor Strange movie. And in some important ways, this is the story, right, that our modern world thinks that we are now living. Take charge of your life. Transform yourself into someone worth loving. I mean, how many books on that can you order on Amazon.com, right? You can have meaning if you choose to have meaning. You can be good if you work at being good. And I love this movie. I think it's a brilliant comedy. And as a follower of Jesus, I think that the story underneath it is a lie. 
we followers of God on the way of Jesus Christ believe a different kind of story. Because the account of the conversion of Paul shows a person who receives a different life, not as the result of his choices or his striving. Paul's life as a gift from God, not purely something of his own work, his own devising. How did I get here? How did I come to possess the self that now possesses me? I know how I tend to narrate myself and my life, right? It all began in Louisville, Kentucky. I, I was raised in a middle-class environment in a comfortable bubble of solid but cautious Midwestern norms and values. Something like that. And modernity teaches us to describe ourselves as mostly self-contrived. Our lives, the result of historical, psychological, genetic development that occurs within ourselves. But there's something more. The writer C.S. Lewis was not really searching for anything in his life at the time in which, in Lewis's words, God closed in on me. And he exclaimed with surprise, so it was you all along? C.S. Lewis didn't find a new life. A new life found him. In 1931, Lewis wrote to a friend, Picture me alone in that room at Oxford, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted, even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of the one who I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared came upon me. I gave in and admitted that God was God, and I knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant com uh, convert in all of England, a prodigal who was struggling uh, who was brought in struggling, kicking, resentful, and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance of escape. He continues, the hardness of God is kinder than the softness of humans, and God's compulsion is our liberation. End quote. Where does that new self come from? Well, for Lewis, he was clear that it's not his own intellectual achievement, not some conclusion of a good argument, not the result of planning his work and then working his plan. It was gift, grace, and the result of surprise. So it was you all along. In our modern world, friends, the self, you know, who we are, becomes an exclusively human construct, something we fabricate through our astute decisions and adventurous choices. I choose, therefore I am. What Paul discovered on that road was that the self is a surprising gift of a creative God. Christians believe that there is no self there until God makes a move, until the embrace, the, the intrusion, the surprise. Paul, that day on the Damascus Road, was not worrying about the meaninglessness of his life. He was not restless when in pursuit of anything, when, when God surprised him, overwhelms him, and certainly God got Paul's undivided attention, right? This is a jolt to our sense of self. What if the life I'm living is not my own? What if I'm not my own idea? What if you are not only the sum of your choices and decisions, but also the result of, as C.S. Lewis puts it, the steady, unrelenting approach of the one who I so earnestly desired not to meet? One blinding light on one Damascus road, and it all changes. In the story of Saul's conversion, there is no development, no history, no precedent, nothing. But a God who shows up, and in showing up, and, and showing up transforms this self into that which the self could never have been on its own. I wonder sometimes... If the God we dream about is far too small? I mean, certainly the God we dream about is often rather safe. The God of American popular opinion, my friends, is utilitarian. It's an instrumental God who is moderately helpful and never disruptive. A God who sometimes is useful in getting us what we think we want in life. The God who hates the people that we hate and roots for our country and probably our favorite baseball team. This this urbane, deistic, theistic, a therapist of a God never actually gets around to doing much of anything, never moves us anywhere, never changes anything. And I don't think that such a small God can ever move from hopelessness to hope. 
right? Such a small God would never seek to dry tears once and for all, would never dare to turn mourning into dancing, would never lift up that which has been put down. Such a small God would never care to surround us with God's love as we walk through the valley of the shadows of death and protect us with a rod and a staff overflowing our cup with God's grace. Such a small God can never let justice roar down on this justice-parched places of our planet like a mighty river, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Such a small God could never have moved Martin Luther King Jr., to write that letter in the Birmingham jail 59 years ago this past April, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Theologian Robert Jensen says that's how you can tell the difference between a true living God and a dead false God. A fake, non-disruptive God will never surprise you. Look, I, not everyone is Paul <laughs> with a huge knock-me-down-on-the-ground conversion moment. That's not what we're talking about. But Paul shows us how God engages, renews, shapes our lives, thanks be to God. And I remember a college student in the last congregation I served. This was her third semester abroad, the third time, third time traveling overseas. Why on earth did she not simply act like most other students? Take her one semester abroad and then go home, get her degree. Why was she so determined to do all this travel? And she responded, well, I'm a student. I'm 20 years old. I figure my major task at this time in my life is to grow up, to be a different person than I was when I arrived here. I found that there's no way to live in a different country, a different language, a different world, and stay the same old me. It's a parable of the Christian life. There is no way to live in God's new world, my friends, and remain the same old you. One more story. Presbyterian minister and prolific author Frederick Beatner came to faith as a young adult, or rather, as he says, faith came to him. Out of college, he wrote a best-selling novel and was the toast of the town. His father had died by suicide when he was young. His family was scattered, and his life was really, as he puts it, without anchor or purpose or direction. And restless, he went to church one day in New York City. And there was legendary preacher George Buttrick, you know, George Buttrick, legendary preacher. He was preaching, and in the sermon, Buttrick said that Jesus is crowned king not on a throne with robe and crown, but in our hearts amid prayers and praise and great laughter. <laughs> and that was it. It was the phrase, great laughter, that stirred something inside of Beatner, and he ceased being his own person and became instead, as he puts it, Christ's person. And years later, after hearing Beekner tell this story, someone sent Beekner a, a transcript of Buttrick's sermon from so long ago. And in it, wouldn't you know, the words and great laughter did not appear, not a single place. It was an ad lib, just thrown in into the sermon at that moment. And that was that, and Beekner was amazed. On such thin threads of grace, chance words, a seemingly innocuous gesture of care or compassion or love, sometimes something perhaps unexpected, on such thin threads of grace hangs the destiny of all of us. Until we consider that this is just how God acts. This is what God Only God knows the self that I meant to be. Only God knows the self that you, by God, will become. Only God can give us a self worth having. And God, God does give in those surprising moments when we're proceeding down our accustomed ruts, just busy looking after ourselves, and there is, as, out of, as if out of nowhere, a light, a voice, a summons, and we know that we've been cornered and we stutter and mutter in astonishment. So it was you all along. Have you known such a surprising, disruptive, transforming encounter with the living Christ? Comfort in even the hardest of places. Hope beyond all reason. Peace that really does pass every understanding. 
Faith enough to move mountains in the service of God's justice. Have you known that? Paul and a host of others are here to tell you, you will. I mean, that's Easter's promise. You will. And may it be so. Amen. Friends, our worship service always includes a moment of thanksgiving. This is our opportunity to make note of God's many gifts in our lives where we pledge ourselves to use those gifts as God invites us to use them, namely, to make this world a better place for others, to reinvest them in other people, and for the common good. We're grateful for all that you do in your own communities and through this church to share God's love and God's compassion. If you are looking for a place to do that, we'd love to have you join us here at the Kirk. We cannot do the work we do without your support, your energy, and your compassion. Your financial gifts help enable our ministry and mission. If you're worshiping on site, we have offering plates available in the narthex for that purpose. You can also contact the church information from our, uh, from church office for more information about how you can take part in our common work. Both in your participation here among us and in your work in the wider world, we thank you for your spirit of generosity and for all that you do to be Christ's hands and feet in the world. Please join with Claudia as she leads all of us in our prayer of thanksgiving. <clears throat> Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. We give thanks, gracious God, for the joy of giving, so that your grace might abound, your love may flourish, and your way be pursued. May others find refreshment and wholesome through our sharing, and may we find joy in generosity and gratitude. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In a moment, we will offer some community prayer for all who are gathered around this worship service for our community and for the world. But first, we will pause and offer a special prayer today for mothers and grandmothers and all others. Uh, Mother's Day, like Father's Day, is a complicated moment, right, for many people. Um, for many, this is a joyous day, one of gratitude and celebration. And for that, we too are so grateful. For some mothers who are joyful and for their families too, they might nevertheless carry with them fatigue or worries or the burden of many expectations. And then there are those who have muddled relationships with their kids or their mothers or who wanted to be a mother but couldn't or those who never wanted to be a mother but is. And there are some who mourn the fact that their mothers are no longer with them, maybe because they have died or because they live so far away. So while our, our country pauses this day for Mother's Day, it's our practice also to pause with a special prayer, to recognize some of the messiness of this moment, to thank God for the good, to lift up the broken, and to claim God's abiding and uncompromising love. So please pray with me as we offer this prayer for mothers, grandmothers, and all others. Let's pray. Loving God, 
who dotes on us with a boundless love that gives human parenting meaning and depth and possibility. On this day that our nation pauses to recognize the mothers and grandmothers in our midst, you tell us that you are there with us, rejoicing when we rejoice, weeping when we weep. And so we thank you for the love of the mothers you have given us. And with all who mark this day with joy, we do too. For all who are fortunate to maintain nurturing bonds with their mothers, we are so grateful. May we see your loving hand behind them, strengthening them as we celebrate each in our lives. Thank you for their care, their compassion, their abiding love. We also know that this day carries complex feelings so, for so many. Therefore, we pray this morning also for those who are strained in their relationships with their mothers, with their children, asking that your heart nevertheless gift us all with love and with hope for understanding and for peace. We pray this day particularly for new mothers, coming to terms with new responsibility and new stress, for expectant mothers wandering and waiting, for mothers who are tired, anxious, or depressed, for those who struggle to balance the tasks of work and family, who imbalance a love for others through lack of self-love, for mothers who are unable to feed their children because of poverty, for, mo for mothers whose children have unique physical, mental, or emotional challenges, for mothers who raise children all on their own, for those who never wanted to be mothers and who struggle with their responsibility, for parents who do not fall within the binary mother-father paradigm, for mothers who have entrusted others to raise their children in their stead, for adoptive parents who raise children as their very own. We pray for those who have lost a child before birth or after, and for those whose children have left home. We pray today for those whose desire to be a mother has not been fulfilled and may never be, for those who provide care to others in many different ways, those who are like mothers unto us and to our loved ones. And so today we ask the same blessing we ask every day. Bless all mothers, O caring God, that their love may be deep and tender, and that they may lead their children to know and do what is good, living not for themselves alone, but for God and for others for the common good. Bless all who have chosen not to be mothers, for whom the expectation to be a mother sometimes is overwhelming, but who offer grace and community and care to us through so many other good gifts. We ask you to bless all mothers everywhere with your own special love as you guide us with your gentle care. And we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our brother, as all God's people say, amen, amen. Now we're going to move to our time of community prayer, and I'm going to lift up some prayer concerns, some of which are specific to our church community. If you're watching online and you don't know any of these people, that's okay. Just send your best thoughts along anyway. If you are online, you can now send your prayer requests in, and I'll share those too. I will end each of our prayer requests with the phrase, O Lord, hear our prayer, and you can say that as well. Please join me. O Lord, hear our prayer. We pray today for the ongoing struggle against COVID-19 those who have died both here and abroad, those who continue to experience the lasting impacts of the disease. We pray for first responders and for all who work to build healthy communities. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. We pray today for the ongoing struggle against systemic racism as we seek to do our part in our lives and in this country. Uh, we ask God to help us claim this work of anti-racism as our very own, as we join with others who seek to follow Jesus Christ and everyone of goodwill to love our neighbors as ourselves. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. We pray today for Ukraine, for the people of that country, for the people of Russia, for those in Eastern Europe, for those who seek safety and who are fleeing war this very morning, for refugees driven from their homes, for people left behind, for those who mourn this death and destruction. We pray today for peace and for the end of tyranny. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. We lift up today the death of the Reverend Jim Walker, Jim and Nadine started worshiping here with us at the Kirk in 1999, just after Jim's retirement, and has been a friend and a colleague in ministry to me and to countless others. Today we join our prayers with so many, expressing gratitude for his life and for his faith. 
The family has not made plans uh, as of yet for a memorial service. We will share that information once it is known. But today we lift the prayers of love for the Reverend Jim Walker. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. We pray today uh, for Sarah Cook. Sarah had a surgical pr uh, procedure this week on her foot. We pray for comfort and for healing for Sarah and joy for Clay as he assists along the way. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. We lift up other names that have been part of our prayer life uh, week after week. We pray today for David Mitchell, for Phil Youngs, for Bob Melton, and Linda Masood. We pray for Michael Lyons, Noreen Curso. Glad to have you here this morning, Noreen. We pray for Betty Price, Betty Vose, Betty Slusher, Gloria McDonald, the McEachin and Young families. We pray for Barb Givens, Wendy Nielsen, Francis Dean, Speck Slaughter, Eileen Mitchell, Brenda Beckley, uh, Marjorie Langford, for Richard and Maggie Cooks, for Baxter Quinn and family, for Kate Schaefer, for Chris from Cherithbrook. We pray for the people of the Cameroon. We pray also today for the Kirk, that God will continue to knit us together. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. And we have a prayer of joy this morning. One graduate that we missed last Sunday, but certainly we wish to celebrate today, is Michael Mardites. Michael is graduating from UMKC School of Computing and Engineering with a Master's in Mechanical Engineering and a focus in Robotics and Artificial Intelligence. That prayer is lifted up by proud parents Tom Mardikes and, and Beckett Mardikes, along with grandparents Ted Beckett and Mert Mardikes. I'm not sure if I got Mert's name right, but I hope she'll forgive me. We celebrate this wonderful accomplishment, and we give thanks to God for Michael this morning. Oh, Lord, hear our prayers. From our chat room, uh, Marilyn McDowell lifts up prayers this morning, both of Happy Mother's Day and the fact that uh, her dad celebrated 92 years, uh, his 92nd uh, birthday, so it's 93 years if you count that first year, on May the 5th of this year. So we give God thanks for that. Oh, Lord, hear our prayers. Just checking to see if there are any other chats from our chat room. I don't believe so. With all of these prayers that we speak aloud in our hearts, as well as the prayers that reside in our spirits, let's turn to God with our spirit of prayer. Please pray with me. Gracious God, you are alive and we rejoice. You are alive and so we can live again. You are alive and you set us free from worry and fear and death and anxiety. You are alive. Alleluia. Help us, we pray. Because the world in which we live is not yet free from hurt and from heartache. Your Easter world is still coming to be. And so we pray today out of hope and concern, prayers of intercession as well as prayers of thanksgiving. As we seek to share your grace and your hope and your promise with our neighbors. We pray today for those around us caring God, particularly those who struggle and who suffer today. Those who are in need for food or shelter or medical care. We pray for those deeply worried that their access to safe medical care will soon be cut off for them or for their neighbor due to someone's imposition of their judgment about what to do with their own body. We pray today for those who mourn today, who seek wholeness of spirit and compassion and grace. Comfort us, we pray, with your love and with your welcome. Help us to offer your presence with all others we encounter on the way. And we pray today for everyone who seeks healing and wholeness, particularly those who face chronic illness, such as heart disease, diabetes, cancer, Parkinson's. We pray for your children everywhere who are living with HIV AIDS, those with dementia and their caregivers, everyone who struggles with mental illness and depression. Help us to rest our finite bodies in your boundless and infant love and care. And we lift up those who seek to mend, those who search after justice and truth, those who work to find reconciliation and repair. Help us find ways to pursue peace, to lift up truth, and to protect the vulnerable. Today we lift up our struggle against COVID-19, ongoing national discord, your call to work to end systemic racism. Help us strive, as Jesus did, for peace and healing, justice and reconciliation for all. We pray today for the health and safety and vitality of communities near and far. And as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught us, we pray today for anyone who wishes to do us harm. In your love and your wisdom, guide us, we pray, O Prince of Peace. We thank you today for this moment to ground ourselves, if only for the time being, in this gathering of your faithful people. As we join with so many others around the world who are grateful for your presence in our lives. And so today we wrap up our prayer 
in Jesus' name, as we say together the prayer that he taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite all who wish to stand with me, please rise, as we sing our final hymn, Christ is Alive, number 246. Christ is risen and the whole world is new again. Christ is risen and life expands to fill every need, every heart, every hope. Christ is risen, so let us rise to meet the moment as we seek to love God with all that we have and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So now, go out in the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be yours forever and ever and ever. Alleluia. Amen. <laughs>